This is the seventh video in the Divided Kingdom series. We're working our way through the kings of the Northern Kingdom, Israel, and today we're looking at Jehu's dynasty. You remember what happened after the prophet Elijah had that big showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal? He ran away. <laughs> <laughs> he, he ran away. Queen Jezebel had a long history of tracking down and killing the Lord's prophets, and Elijah probably figured he had better get out of town fast. He'd certainly be at the top of her hit list now, and he wasn't sticking around to find out. He escaped Mount Carmel way up on the Mediterranean coast, and he ran all the way to Beersheba, way down in the southwest part of Judah, and that's a distance of about 150 miles. Again, if you're in Wisconsin, it's like going from La Crosse to Minneapolis, except he didn't have a car and <laughs> there wasn't an interstate. He had to walk or run, or maybe he took a donkey. But we're still talking about a number of weeks to get where he wanted to go. Once he arrived, he continued another day's journey out into the desert, and that's where he sat down and waited to die. <laughs> I'm thinking if he really wanted to die, he could have just stayed in Israel and saved himself a long trip. But instead, an angel showed up and sent him out even further into the desert, all the way to Mount Horeb, better known as Mount Sinai. Now, nobody knows for sure where Mount Sinai is, but it's definitely a whole lot further south than Beersheba. And that's where Elijah spent a tired and miserable night in a cave. That's also where God appeared to Elijah in that still, small voice, 1 Kings 19. And God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? It was also here that the Lord commissioned Elijah to Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave seven thousand in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. It appears that although God gave the commission to Elijah, the responsibility for anointing Hazael was actually delegated to Elijah's replacement because it actually ends up being Elisha who makes the trip to Damascus to anoint Syria's new king. Elisha came to Damascus. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And when it was told him, The man of God has come here. The king said to Hazael, Take a present with you, and go to meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord through him, saying, Shall I recover from this sickness? So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him, all kinds of goods of Damascus, forty camel loads. When he came and stood before him, he said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this sickness? And Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, You shall certainly recover. But the Lord has shown me that he shall certainly die. And he fixed his gaze and stared at him until he was embarrassed. And the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why does my Lord weep? He answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the people of Israel. You will set on fire their fortresses, 
and you will kill their young men with the sword and dash in pieces their little ones and rip open their pregnant women. And Hazael said, What is your servant who is but a dog, that he should do this great thing? Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you are to be king over Syria. Well, Elisha meets Hazael, and he says, I know the harm you will do to the Israelites. Then he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? And he answered, He told me that you would certainly recover. But the next day he took the bedcloth and dipped it in water and spread it over his face till he died. And Hazael became king in his place. Once again, we see that a ruthless, lying, murdering scoundrel is exactly the guy God chooses to accomplish his divine purpose. <laughs> Go figure. God specifically selected Hazael for the job of punishing Israel. Now, Hazael's purpose for doing it and God's purpose for setting him up to do it are two completely different things, but for Israel, it, the result will feel exactly the same. Like Baasha, who we looked at in the fourth video, and like the Assyrians and the Babylonians will eventually get to, Hazael is another tool in the hands of the master craftsman chiseling away at Israel's stubborn unfaithfulness. Well, it was also Elisha, indirectly, who anointed Jehu to be God's avenging tool against Ahab's family. The five generations of Jehu's family are the longest lasting dynasty in the history of the northern kingdom, lasting 88 years, over twice the length of Omri's dynasty, and almost half as long as the northern kingdom itself. Under Jehu's dynasty, Israel gets as grand as it's ever going to get, with the apex being around Jeroboam II. After that, it's a quick downhill slide into oblivion. Jehu served as commander in the army until Elisha vicariously tapped him for the top job in Israel. At the time, Israel and Judah were allies. They were fighting King Hazael. And during one battle, uh, King Joram of Israel was wounded. So, leaving their armies to carry on without them, he and King Ahaziah of Judah headed back to Jezreel to recoup. That's when the strange messenger appeared in camp. And God had told Elijah to do it. Elijah apparently delegated the job to Elisha and Elisha handed it off to, you guessed it, a prophet with no name. Taking Jehu aside, this prophet privately anointed Jehu king over Israel. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council, and he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, To which of us all? And he said, To you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house. And the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. Jehu didn't waste any time. His men immediately acknowledged him as king. 
Then they all set off to kill the poor wounded King Joram. Then Joram king of Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu and met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace can there be, so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Then Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treachery! Oh, Ahaziah! And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart, and he sank in his chariot. He shot him in the back, then intentionally threw the body into Naboth's field, fulfilling the prophecy against Ahab. Jehu said to Bidkar his aide, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father, how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. Now therefore take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. Then they went on to kill King Ahaziah. Now, Second Chronicles reads slightly different from Second Kings, but it reinforces the fact that God was in complete control of both of these murders. But it was ordained by God that the downfall of Ahaziah should come about through his going to visit Joram. For when he came there, he went out with Jehoram to meet Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to destroy the house of Ahab. God brought about King Ahaziah's downfall. Here's a map that might give us a better frame of reference. Jehu was anointed king at Ramoth Gilead, uh, where the big arrow is pointing down in the upper right hand corner. He had been fighting King Hazael, who probably attacked in the early spring of 841 BC. Now, unfortunately for him, Assyria's Shalmaneser III began his annual campaign in May, and he was headed west. Once Hazael heard of Shalmaneser's advance, he probably withdrew to reposition his forces in order to defend Damascus. That freed Jehu to leave Ramoth Gilead and then drive the 45 miles to Jezreel, where he killed the wounded Joram outright, but Ahaziah escaped. Jehu chased Ahaziah south to Beth Hagen, where Ahaziah was wounded, but he escaped again. Darn it. And he got away to Megiddo in the upper left. Well, Jehu found 42 relatives of King Ahaziah at the shearing house in Beth Echid, and he killed them, of course. And finally, he caught up with Ahaziah in Megiddo and finally killed him. Do you remember why Jehu had to kill King Ahaziah? Well, his mother was Ahab's daughter. That made him Ahab's grandson. <laughs> Bad news for you, Ahaziah. Having finished off both kings, Jehu returns to Jezreel to tie up all the loose ends. And she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, is it peace, you Zimri, murderer of your master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, and they trampled on her. Then he went in and ate and drank, and he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, 
they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. When they came back and told him, he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, This is Jezebel. Do you remember who Zimri was? This is what Jezebel shouted out the window, remember? Is it peace, you Zimri? Zimri usurped control and wiped out King Baasha's entire family 44 years earlier. And just like Jehu, Zimri was also a military commander when he staged his coup. But what happened to Zimri? <laughs> he only lasted seven days before someone else staged a coup and Zimri killed himself. I think that uh, Jezebel was hoping the same fate would befall Jehu. Jehu killed everyone in Jezreel related to or even associated with Ahab relatives, chief officials, priests, close friends, family, pets, anyone who might cause him problems in the future. <laughs> that was just the way the usurping king did things. Once he achieved complete control in Jezreel, he sent to the authorities in Samaria, daring them to name one of Ahab's remaining 70 sons as king and those entrusted with protecting and raising the king's children instead delivered their seventy heads in baskets to save their own necks. These were piled up outside Jehu's front gate. If you are on my side, and if you are ready to obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come to me at Jezreel tomorrow at this time. Now the king's sons, seventy persons, were with the great men of the city who were bringing them up. And as soon as the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slaughtered them, seventy persons, and put their heads in baskets, and sent them to him at Jezreel. Well, next he headed off to Samaria to finish off the rest of Ahab's relatives there. This guy was really on a mission. Along the way, Jehu runs into a fellow named Jehonadab, son of Rechab. Now, after determining his allegiance, Jehu offered him a ride into town. Together they enter Samaria, killing everyone there associated with Ahab's family. Finally, Jehu takes on the prophets of Baal. Then Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. Now, therefore, call to me all the prophets of Baal all his worshippers and all his priests. Let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu did it with cunning in order to destroy the worshippers of Baal. And Jehu ordered, Sanctify a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it, and Jehu sent throughout all Israel and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left who did not come. And they entered the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was filled from one end to the other. He said to him who was in charge of the wardrobe, Bring out the vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. So he brought out the vestments for them. Then Jehu went into the house of Baal with Jehonadab the son of Rechab, and he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search! and see that there is no servant of the Lord here among you, but only the worshippers of Baal. Then they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had stationed eighty men outside and said, The man who allows any of those whom I give into your hands to escape shall forfeit his life. So as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, Jehu said to the guard and to the officers, Go in and strike them down. Let not a man escape. So when they put them to the sword, the guard and the officers cast them out and went into the inner room of the house of Baal, and they brought out the pillar that was in the house of Baal and burned it. 
And they demolished the pillar of Baal, and demolished the house of Baal, and made it a latrine to this day. The temple was destroyed, the worshippers were destroyed, and the building was converted into a public toilet. <laughs> Whoever said God doesn't have a sense of humor? Well, as you can see from the last few slides, Jehu killed an awful lot of people. He murdered a Phoenician princess turned queen. Two, count them, two heads of state, King Joram of Israel and King Ahaziah of Judah, 70 princes from the house of Israel, 42 members of Judah's royal family. He also killed countless other people that we have no way of knowing how many those are. And then he went on to kill an unknown number of priests and worshippers of Baal. Jehu completely and ruthlessly exterminated Ahab's entire family, wiped out the false prophets of Baal, burned their altars, destroyed their temple, and therefore... And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart. Your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. God rewarded him with four more generations to reign on the throne in Israel. And as exactly as God promised, we'll see that four generations followed Jehu. Jehoahaz, Joash, Jeroboam the second and Zechariah. But now the bad news. You screwed up kid. Notwithstanding all the apparent zeal for Yahweh, Jehu is not listed as one of the good kings. Yeah, he destroyed Baal worship all right, but he didn't keep the law of Yahweh and he never Turn from the sins of Jeroboam. He didn't remove those golden calves at Dan and Bethel. Also, Jehu's violence went far beyond his job requirements. Although the Lord commended and even rewarded him, Jehu killed a lot more people in Jezreel who technically were not blood relatives of Ahab. And therefore, he suffered disaster after disaster at the hands of that guy in Syria, King Hazael, who's still hard at work doing the job God hired him to do. <laughs> Thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel. But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. In those days the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. Hazael defeated them throughout the territory of Israel. After fulfilling his promise to Jehu, God will address that issue in his own time. Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Well, the downside of killing thousands of people is that you always run the risk of incurring lots of enemies. 
especially if some of the people you kill include the king of a sovereign nation-state on your southern border. That was certainly the case with Jehu. So, in order to protect himself from revenge by Judah and its allies, and in the face of mounting pressure from King Hazael on his northern border, Jehu needed to find an ally, a big ally, and pretty quick, too. Well, Shalmaneser III just happened to be in the area. After unsuccessfully besieging Damascus, Shalmaneser decided to visit Mount Carmel before heading back home, and Jehu went to see him. He cut a deal, placing Israel under Assyria's protective umbrella. Protection. Yeah, that'll be the day. This is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III. It was discovered in Nineveh in 1846 by Sir Henry Layard. It's now on display in the British Museum, and it depicts the many battles and conquests of Shalmaneser's 31-year reign. If you look closely at the second panel down, you'll see King Jehu bowing down before Shalmaneser with the caption, The Tribute of Jehu, Son of Amri, I received from him silver, gold, etc., etc., and all that stuff. This is the earliest known image of an Israelite, and he's on his knees bowing to the wrong guy. Here's another interesting archaeological find. The inscription was discovered near Dan on Israel's northern border with Syria. It's believed to have been part of a monument erected by King Hazael commemorating his many victories, and archaeologists believe this monument was later smashed by Jehoash, Jehu's grandson, who battled Hazael's son, Ben-Hadad II, three times in this same area. The inscription describes the beginning of Hazael's reign and some of his many battles in which he claims to have killed 70 kings. Interestingly, he takes credit for killing both King Joram of Israel and King Ahaziah of Judah. Now this collaborates the biblical account of his war with these two kings, but of course it contradicts 2 Kings 9 that says Jehu killed them. But it's not unusual for kings to embellish their stories, ha <laughs> ha, say, lie, uh, to make themselves look better. Even sometimes they claim achievements by their predecessors. And in this case, Hazael really was fighting these guys when they were both killed. So if he skips over some of the finer details of who actually struck the blow, it's, it's not that much of a stretch to include them in his own story. <laughs> what makes this fragment especially important, though, is the one line of Aramaic containing the phrase, House of David. This is the first known extra-biblical reference to King David ever found. When Jehu died after a long 28-year reign, he was succeeded by his son Jehoahaz, whose name means possession of Yahweh or possibly Yahweh has held firmly. In his case, it could be either way. Uh, I believe Yahweh did restrain him considerably. Upon assuming the throne, he immediately began undoing any good his father had accomplished. He followed the sins of Jeroboam, causing the people of Israel to sin, and returned to Baal worship. His 17-year reign was marked by a series of embarrassing military defeats at the hands of King Hazael, whose job, you'll remember, was to inflict a lot of pain on Israel. He'd been doing a pretty good job of it throughout the reign of Jehu and was usually successful now as he attacked with his son, Ben-Hadad II. Amazingly, one instance, Jehoahaz actually did turn to Yahweh for help and 
Amazingly, Yahweh answered his plea and allowed Israel to win one, but only one. <laughs> Although Israel lived in peace for a while, Jehoahaz and Israel continued to worship Baal and Asherah, so when King Hazael attacked, he usually won. The Lord, using King Hazael, reduced Jehoahaz's forces to a mere 50 mounted troops, 10 chariots, and 10,000 infantry. <laughs> That's not much of an army. After Jehoahaz's death, his son Jehoash finally repelled the Syrians. Jehoash was Jehu's grandson, the third generation of Jehu's dynasty. He's also called Joash, just to make things a little confusing, and he reigned 16 years. He followed the evil patterns set by all the previous kings, with one notable exception. He actually loved and honored the prophet Elisha. In fact, when Elisha died, Jehoash cried. Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. For this and for other reasons, God allowed Jehoash to recover much of the territory that King Hazael had stolen away from them. During Jehoash's reign, Judah and Israel were once again enemies. And one of the major events that took place during that reign was when King Amaziah of Judah goaded him into a fight that he really didn't want, but once engaged, he utterly trounced Amaziah in one big decisive battle at Beth Shemesh. Can you remember any other significant events that took place at Beth Shemesh? Maybe from the book of 1 Samuel? Long, long, long time ago? Well, the Israelites battled the Philistines there and lost. And after the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and moved it around from city to city for a while, they wanted to unload it fast, and they returned it to Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh was located a mere 15 miles from Jerusalem. Very, very close indeed, and very threatening to the city. Back in the book of uh, Judges, it was given to the Levites, and it was situated at an intersection between two major trade routes, and it guarded the main route right into Jerusalem from the west side. Well, anyway, Jehoash defeated Amaziah's army, marched right downtown, captured the king right in his own palace, and, of course, sacked the temple and hauled off a bunch of prisoners. His son and successor reigned 41 years, which was a pretty long time for a kingdom whose average reign was only about 10 years each. Jeroboam II reigned almost twice as long as the next longest reigning king in the kingdom, but very little is recorded in scripture about him. The middle 8th century BC was relatively prosperous for both kingdoms, and once again, they were at peace. Jeroboam II uh, successfully concluded the wars that his father had waged against Syria. He restored much of the territory that Israel had previously lost and once again reconquered poor Moab and Jordan. The military and diplomatic successes brought in lots of money and according to the prophet Amos, wealthy citizens had both winter and summer homes. So sweet. Things were looking good for the nation, and secular historians consider Jeroboam II as one of the most successful kings of Israel. But despite the acquired peace and prosperity, there was much injustice. Amos states twice in his short book that the needy were sold for a pair of shoes. 
Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and turn aside the way of the afflicted, a man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Jeroboam the second followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam the first by continuing the golden calf worship. Plus, he also allowed Baal worship to flourish. Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. Because of Jeroboam's commitment to evil, Amos prophesied that the Lord would punish Jeroboam, bringing the sword against his house. The prophets Jonah and Hosea also lived during this period, and you'll recall that this time is only about 30 to 50 years before the Assyrians would come in, destroy them all. Jonah, in fact, was tasked with calling Assyria to repentance so that they themselves wouldn't be wiped out before they could accomplish the job Yahweh had created for them to do. Hosea was to serve as an object lesson for Israel, and his wife was unfaithful to him just as Israel had been unfaithful to Yahweh. Before Hosea finally divorced her, she bore him three children. Jezreel. Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. No mercy. Call her name no mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. And not my people. Call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Just like with King Solomon, King Jeroboam the first, Baasha and Ahab, the Lord's sword against the house of Jeroboam did not fall until after Jeroboam the second was dead. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with the plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Following the guy who reigned 41 years was Zechariah, the guy that sword fell on. He only lasted six months, and he was the last of Jehu's dynasty. His name means memory of the Lord because the Lord remembered his promise to Jehu. He gave him four more generations, but... He also remembered his prophecy against Jeroboam II. Zechariah was assassinated by Shalom, and then Shalom became king, <laughs> but only for a while. I'd call this a twofer. God fulfilled two prophecies for the price of one. And that's the end of the house of Jehu. In our next video, we'll start with Shalom and finish off the last five kings of the northern kingdom. None of these guys last very long, so you only need to read two chapters if you want to read ahead. Second Kings chapters 15 and 17. Okay, have a good day.